And thanks everyone for um, showing up and the busy start of the semester. Welcome back to the students. Um, so it's, yeah, it'll be fun to, to chat over the next uh, hour or so with you. So just, I guess, I like to set a context for why I focus on working landscapes and what I mean by that, and also the role they play in conservation. So, you know, I think for a lot of us, you know, when we grow up or our experience in the world, if you were to, if someone were to ask you, all right, picture the kind of places where conservation happens, you'd probably think about something like this. And actually, you know, I'm gonna just turn off the light here. Yeah. Get a nicer view there. You know, we might picture, you know, a landscape like this, you know, majestic mountains or, you know, some forest that looks kind of pristine, right? And that's what we picture when we think about nature, when we think about conservation. Um, but that's actually really restrictive, right? There's, we can't focus on only these kinds of landscapes or places where we don't see as much of a presence of human activity. Um, and we can't do that for a few reasons. I mean, protected areas are important, but protected areas alone or parks are not going to be sufficient to do the work we need to protect biodiversity on the planet. They're not going to be sufficient to safeguard the services that we derive from the environment that really help sustain our own health and well-being. And we see this over and over around the world as evidence um, for why protected areas alone aren't gonna do the job. One thing is, is that we can't keep all human activities and all pressures outside of protected areas, or, or we can't you know, kind of exclude them. And so this was a study that was done reviewing hundreds of protected areas around the world. And what you're looking at is in the top box of graph, is inside reserves or protected areas, and this one is outside of reserves. And any red bars show you where conditions are worsening. So whether it's population growth, forest cover, logging, fires, pollution, road expansion, traffic, you can see both within and outside reserves, conditions continue to deteriorate. So one issue why protected areas alone don't work is that we can't enforce them enough. Um, another is that a lot of the important ecosystems that we care about occur outside of protected areas. If we take the U.S. as an example, you can see that for a lot of the major types of ecosystems we have, whether it's eastern forests or grasslands, western forests, those that they're occurring, many of them outside of public lands. So they're on privately owned landscapes where we need to find different strategies in order to protect them. And of course, in many regions in the world, you know, having protected areas, excluding people, um, isn't going to work when they're so dependent, their families, their communities, on the resources in that local vicinity. And so for those reasons, that's why um, you know, I focus and many uh, conservation organizations, agencies, you know, researchers, conservation practitioners around the world have now expanded their view to not only think about, yeah, protected areas and parks have a particular role to play, but we need to have a much wider array of tools that we can use to really advance conservation. And so this is just one example of a working landscape from Colombia. And it's all of this land that you're seeing is used in some way to support you know, the livelihoods of people in this area. So you might be wondering, okay, well, Ken mentioned she studies birds. That seems like a pretty broad topic. How are birds you know, are pretty specific? How are we gonna link these two? Well, it turns out that birds are a really excellent tool to use if you want to understand sort of the environmental or ecological side of conservation and socio-ecological systems. So birds occur pretty much everywhere in the world, right? But a lot of species are very specialized in the kinds of habitats that they require. And so if you were to give anyone who knows a lot about birds a list of all the species that occur in a particular place, it could tell you pretty well what the environmental conditions were. And so that means birds are good indicators of environmental conditions. They're pretty easy to survey um, relative to other groups of organisms. They're charismatic, people like them. And so there are all of these benefits to, to focusing on them. 
Birds also, many of birds are migratory. And so they're moving across entire hemispheres. And so they really help us to think across you know, geopolitical boundaries. Um, so here what you're looking at is a graphic from eBird um, data and models that were produced using those data. So this is a citizen science program that's run by the Lab of Ornithology. Each dot shows you the center of the distribution for one individual species, and you're looking across the year. So really what you're seeing is, you know, these 119 species and how they're moving across the hemisphere every year. You know, so those, these birds are connecting us. And we have a lot of information about birds as well. And so using the power of citizen science, you know, other big data sets, we're able to know more about the habitats and the places where birds are occurring throughout the year. You might be familiar with the barn swallow. This is a common species um, you know, that occurs. You might see it sometimes nesting you know, under roof eaves. Um, and so every place where you see color, that's where it's occurring over the course of a year. The brighter the color, the more abundant the bird is. And so this allows us to really be thinking at much broader scales than we've ever been able to do before. Um, so in the, in the case of um, what we've been able to do um, in some respects is to quantify the extent to which many migratory birds are relying on protected areas versus unprotected areas over the course of a year. And so this is showing some results from a paper that came out a couple of years ago um, that we did with colleagues out at the Lab of Ornithology where we looked at 22 common species of migratory birds that winter in Central, South America, and the Caribbean. And what we find is across the year, they are relying very heavily on sort of privately owned land, land that's occurring outside of protected areas. And so along here, you're seeing kind of the percent of the land that they use that's protected over the entire year, the weeks over the year, the purple is non-breeding, green is breeding season. And what you can see is that for lands that are highly protected, this would be like a wilderness area, very restricted. They're only using less than 2% of that land throughout the year. For moderately protected lands, this would be like a national park where you, it accommodates use you know, and, and some development, but you know, it's, it's very protected, still only 3 to 5%. Lightly protected land, this would be like a national forest that is having some use and some extraction of resources. They're only using 2 to 9% of the, the land throughout the year. So what we see is that for migratory birds, they're actually using these working landscapes where we need to find ways to accommodate then human needs and also the ecological needs that arise as well. And so what I want to do for the rest of the talk is focus on one system, which is coffee production, which is really a good example of how we can try to really think more broadly about how the same landscapes that we need to support human communities can be the same landscapes that are actually supporting ecosystem services and conservation and biodiversity. So coffee is a really important crop around the world. Right? We know it covers about 10 million hectares worldwide. In terms of the social impact, over 25 million people rely directly on coffee for their livelihoods. Um, if you think about indirect um, reliance, some of the estimates are more like 100 million people. But it has a profound social impact. And if we look where coffee is planted or grown around the world, we see its connection to biodiversity. So here, um, the orange indicates where we have biodiversity hotspots, so areas with a ton of species. Right? And in yellow are coffee growing regions. And if you're a, a chocolate fan, those are in blue indicated. Right? And so what, what probably strikes you immediately is the, the congruence of where coffee is grown in biodiversity hotspots. So that alone, just the <coughs> co-occurrence right there, tells us that the decisions that farmers are making about how to grow their coffee are going to have really important consequences for species conservation as well. 
And one of the most critical decisions a farmer can make is whether they grow their coffee under trees or in full sun. Now, historically, coffee was grown as an understory crop. It was grown under mature trees and actually in forest conditions where they, you know, kind of clear out some of the, the undergrowth in order to plant these coffee trees. And you're looking at these kinds of systems here. These shrubs are the coffee plants. Um, and historically, then this was the way coffee was produced. But over the last several decades, we've seen an enormous transition around the world to growing coffee as a monoculture in full sun. So really like a corn crop, right? And this would be one example. So now most of the coffee in the world is grown in these kinds of conditions. And so you don't have to be a biologist, right, to, to compare these two and to think, oh, this one's going to have way more value for other species, for healthy environments, than will this one. And so why did people make this transition, right? What a, because I think a lot of times, you know, governments, countries really boil down the decision to this. Well, it's about planting trees or maximizing yield. And there is thought to be an inherent conflict between the two. And there can be, right? That's not to say people were imagining that. It's true that in some situations, in some climates, if it's cloudy, if it's rainy, if it's very cool and you have a lot of tree cover, that can negatively impact yields. But it's not that simple, right? Like most things in the world. So for example, one of the things that oftentimes isn't considered is the kind of coffee bean that is the coffee berry that's being grown. Um, Arabica coffee is the one most of us are probably familiar with as the better tasting coffee. Um, and Arabica grows better under cooler conditions, um, but it, and it also gets a higher price, generally, not always. Um, however, in sun coffee, they're growing Robusta, which is much more bitter, has higher yields, but has a much lower price out on the market. Robusta, like a lot of people will refer to that as like, well, it's kind of like the gas station coffee. Right, or more like Folgers or Maxwell's House or those like conventional big production coffee. There are also a lot of other ecosystem services and other sources of income that can flow from shade coffee farms that oftentimes are not really considered when farmers or governments might be encouraging you know, converting from shade to sun. Um, so this is just some examples. You can have wood forest products that are coming from overstory trees or other plants in those systems. Um, you know, there's ecotourism. This is a big thing now in Colombia where they're even looking at ecotourism for birds on coffee farms. So combining kind of agrotourism and ecotourism, right? Carbon storage where you might be able to get payments on the red programs, food security, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of other flows of income. Um, so just these are some examples of the common fruits and fibers that are grown in coffee farms. So these are providing not only nutrient or food subsidies to the farmers and their families, but they also can be sold on the market. And in some cases, there have been research showing things like mangoes can, in some years, um, generate more income to farmers than can the coffee itself. So these can be really substantial. Trees on the landscape also can help reduce soil erosion. Um, they prevent landslides, which are big issues in a lot of the regions, um, at least in Latin America, where coffee is grown because they're mountainous, steep slopes. Um, you remove those trees and you're much more likely to get landslides that are not only going to it, of course, be devastating for communities and impactful on, from kind of that disaster perspective, but also erode the soils, um, bring sediments or other um, chemicals might be running off into water systems. And speaking of chemicals, we know that shade coffee, just because it's a much more complex system, um, it requires far fewer chemical inputs in the way of pesticides and fertilizers as well. One of the reasons you don't have to use as many fertilizers is because the farmers are usually planting overstory trees that are nitrogen fixing. 
So they're actually helping to bring in nutrients into those soils. And then the last thing, just to highlight where we kind of started, was the biodiversity, right? If you have coffee grown in a complex system with lots of different plant species and layers in the, in the forest stratum, I mean, inherently, that's providing much more habitat for different kinds of organisms compared to sun coffee. And that can be really important for, for many groups of species, not only for a lot of the resident species that are spending the entire year in the tropics, but also for migratory birds. So this is another animation from Eber. This one shows species richness. So the more purple and dark the color, the greater the number of species are at that location. And so what you can see is that for a lot of these migratory birds, both in the northern Andes and in Central America, those areas are really dark, you know, reddish purple because there are a lot of species song, of spot songbirds that are overwintering in these coffee growing landscapes. Um, so because of their importance, you know, my students and I have been studying coffee um, growing landscapes and the, the ecological communities within them since about 2005. Um, you know, we've we study these you know different kinds of shade coffee systems. Some are very rustic. Some are more um, like this, where you're seeing it's just coffee grown under. It's kind of a shaded monoculture. It's called where you just have overstory trees, kind of park-like conditions. We've also looked at other kinds of agroforestry that are really common in the region, like silvopasture. So this is increasingly um, used. Um, as a way to get more trees on the landscape, even in systems where you're raising cattle for beef production. And in a lot of these systems, there's um, mature forest occurs both in terms of the primary or old growth forest. There's a little bit of that remaining in some of the Andean landscapes, but oftentimes there's thick second growth forest. And so one of the, um, the patterns that oftentimes surprises people is that our migratory birds, many of them are actually more heavily using the landscapes that are actively used by people, you know, as well. So here we're looking at, this was um, a study that my, um, I did with my graduate student, Gabriel Colorado, uh, several years ago, where we were surveying sites from Venezuela down to Peru. Um, and these were random locations and coffee growing regions. And we found that Migratory birds were, you know, which is a surprise for a lot of people, less abundant in the mature forest. And even um, then, if you compare them to second growth forests, shaded monoculture, pastures with trees. And so as long as there are trees, even those disturbed systems are actually heavily used by a lot of these migratory birds. So one of the things that um, if you study ecology or if you're interested in conservation that you would probably know and might be thinking right now is that, all right, well, if they're using these areas, that doesn't necessarily mean they're good for the birds, right? We know that we, as humans, we change the environment in pretty profound ways that sometimes it can look really good, but you go there and it's awful for the species, right? And it doesn't actually support their health or survival. Um, so we've also spent a lot of time really trying to examine their condition and survival. And we do this in a, um, a method called um, mist netting first, where we'll put up nets where we can intercept the birds as they're moving through the canopy. Um, and it doesn't hurt them, you can extract them out. And so down here in the Andes, because a lot of them are moving through flocks, we'll actually raise um, two different sort of tiers of nets where you can raise them up like flagpoles. And what you can see in the yellow dot, the circles, those are individual birds that are caught. So you can intercept a whole flock, lower the birds down, and then you can measure them, you know, you can you can humiliate them or shame them. <laughs> this is this is where they think like I'm being eaten. Something's actively eating me. <laughs> I would think that probably. But you know we can we can get their weight, you know, their size, what sex they are, their age. And we also fit them with these colored bands that allow us to recycle them to know if they've survived without having to keep recapturing them because that won't work. It's, you know, would be very um, 
you know, just I don't know, stressful for the bird, but also they learn, like we would, not to fly into these nets after a while. So I'll show you a couple of, um, a couple of graphs, but first I want to orient you. So when we talk about body condition, it's, we have to use an approach kind of like, if, um, like the body mass index you would use for people, right? Because you can't just look at weight because the bigger the skeletal size, obviously the more they weigh. So we also want to know, was that bird fatter or thinner than you'd expect for its weight? So on these graphs, there will be you know, a horizontal line that indicates sort of zero, anything above that, shows you that it's heavier than you'd expect, which for a bird is good because they need that fat in order to power the migration back north to breed. Remember, we're catching them in the winter, but they still have to go back up to their breeding grounds. And fat is the currency that allows them to do that. And on these graphs too, on the x-axis, that's the day of the season. And so, um, or the time of the day. So if we look just over the course of a day first, for some of these migratory birds, these are different warblers that we're looking at. So the blue line is the zero. Um, and so you can see over the course of the day, you know, after they fasted all night, they always start out a little light. Um, but then they're able to actually gain weight. They improve their condition as they're foraging in coffee farms over the course of a day. That's good news. But we also see this over the season as well. So here we're looking at some of the same species and some other warblers. And we can see again over the course of the season from the beginning of the winter when they show up. So not surprisingly, they're pretty light because they've just migrated from you know, the Northern hemisphere. You know, they arrive and they start gaining weight as they stay in these coffee farms over the season. So those are positive indicators. When we look at survival, we also see that survival is really high. And so um, this is sort of how you recite some of these birds. And as you're out there and you look for the flocks and just spend a lot of time trying to recite them all within weekly intervals to know if they've made it. Um, and we found that within the breeding season and wintering seasons, because we were comparing both, survival is over 95% for most of these species. So from the bird perspective, right, that conservation perspective, using birds as indicators, we get really good signals that the coffee, shade coffee farms are actually providing habitat that's at least suitable enough to attract large numbers of birds in order to um, allow them to improve their condition and to survive within and across years. And I'll, I'll just mention one interesting anecdote. You know, since we have these birds marked, we're able to see them year after year. And they do show very strong ties, what we would call site fidelity, to many of these coffee farms where they're returning year after year. We found in some coffee farms, the same corner of the farm, there was like a female cerulean warbler that would return five years in a row. And so they're really attached to these places. So although, um, I guess for an ornithologist or an ecologist, you know, we might think, all right, well, we found out the answer. The shade coffee farms can be good habitat for a lot of these birds. We're done. Our study's done. We move on. We got the answer. We, of course, know that that's actually not particularly useful or helpful. You know, if we don't think about how we actually change behavior, or how do we implement it? Um, these new recommendations, right, which um, have been actually being kind of coming from various parts of the conservation and scientific communities for the last couple of decades now to have more shade coffee out on the landscape. So how do we affect this change? Because we know that farmers are making, you know, a lot of choices out there, um, you know, really considering what's going to be best for their families, for their communities, what seems feasible, you know, how do we really try to, you know, provide or create a system that will enable changes in behavior. And so there are often, you know, two approaches when, you know, one tends to turn to when it comes to shifting behavior, you know, kind of the carrot or incentives or more regulations like that stick or punishment. And overwhelmingly with the coffee, you know, most is focused on these incentives, really thinking of positive ways we can really shift behaviors or change norms. 
Um, and a lot of this work I've done um, here in collaboration with colleagues and the Dyson School um, and Johnson School as well. So Miguel Gomez was a key collaborator leading up the social and economic side of this study where we were working in Colombia to try to understand, okay, let's think about incentives from a variety of different um, angles. Right, there are natural incentives kind of from having a healthy environment, you know, what might those be? What are incentives that might um, play out on the economic side with families, communities, or even with coffee quality? And so I'll just touch on some of these um, as we go. So from the, the price side of the equation, that's a really important focal point if we want to have more sustainably grown coffee. Um, it's not easy making a living from coffee. Um, the price for coffee is extremely volatile, especially in the commodity market. Um, so if you don't know what a commodity is, basically is that there's no, price, there's no differentiation among that product, right? Like you could take coffee from any farm, put it all in a vat, and it'll all get the same price, right? A bean is a bean is a bean. So that would be the commodity market. Um, and that's not a really good place for farmers to be, especially when we think that they're already constrained to getting very, very little of the price that's paid for the coffee. Generally speaking, only about five to 10% of the, um, the retail price is actually going back to the farmers. So they're really on the edge already. And so what we're seeing now is a lot, of, um, a lot of farmers are trying individually, but especially cooperatives, um, where you have these associations of coffee <coughs> growers. These can be really strong in some regions. So like in Colombia, there are a lot of cooperatives that really work closely with farmers to try to help support their lives. Um, and that's usually the cooperatives are more for, focused on the social side. But what they've been doing now in many areas is trying to get their farmers to differentiate their product by having some sort of specialty label. And so what they're trying to do is to get them out of that commodity market. Right? And this is one place, though, where, where we really have an opportunity if we want more environmentally kind of sustainable coffee produced. Right? Because some of the specialty markets can try to differentiate their, their coffee from others in terms of the environmental benefits. Right. And so we see this, um, and one example is through third-party certification. Right. So there are different kinds of labels that certify coffee, and what certification does is it's really a tool for the consumer in a way. So the consumer is able to know that the coffee that they purchase um, adheres to certain kinds of standards. In some cases, the standards are social, like you might have heard of fair trade coffee, right? Um, and sometimes, like with organic, it's the standards are related to chemical use. Um, but other ones are more focused a bit more heavily on the environment. So the two that are the most environmental focused are Rainforest Alliance and like, Bird Friendly Coffee. You know, and so bird-friendly coffee, though, is, the, is really the gold standard. Right? They're going to have the most stringent of all um, environmental standards. Um, but because of that, the uptake is way less. Rainforest Alliance has been much broader, and their standards have changed somewhat, but they're probably the next down the rung. Um, so you might be asking, well, why do we have certifications at all? Why can't we just buy shade-grown coffee? Well, I'll say you can, and that for sure is better than buying conventional coffee. Right? So anywhere, any shift you can make, in my view, is positive, right? away from conventional. And so you'll see that there are things like the shade-grown you know, coffee, um, different kinds of labels, but it might not be certified with a particular environmental standard. And so um, what the, the people that run the certifications program would say, um, and, there's, and there is merit to it, is that without a certification, you just don't quite know what that means. So because shade coffee systems can vary widely. Um, so you can have everything from the shaded monoculture 
right, that I showed that one picture of, all the way up to a really rustic forest where you might have some coffee produced in the understory. Right, all of those are shade. So what might it look like? It can look like this could be shade, you know, or this where it looks pretty forest-like, or it could look a bit more like this. I mean, not too bad, but very different. Might be this. In some cases, um, some people consider banana to be shade, right? Um, so you, you can see that there are very different, different kinds of shade coffee out there. And so again, certification just gives very specific standards. So it really allows the consumer to discern what they're purchasing. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. But the downside is that certifications are, are, they still comprise a very small part of the market. They can be very difficult for a lot of um, farmers to get certified. You know, there are sometimes time lags, you know, how long has it been since chemicals were used? If your neighbor's using chemicals, that might impact your ability to become certified. It can be expensive. Farmers bear the, the, um, the cost of having third party certifiers come. And all this is done sometimes in hopes of a price premium. Although it's interesting talking to like Rainforest Alliance when you and I asked um, the head of their sustainability group, well, what caused most of the farmers to become rainforest certified? Well, the, what caused it was the buyer said, we are now only sourcing from certified coffee. And so then they have to switch. So a lot of times it's not it's difficult enough for individuals to switch voluntarily in most cases. Um, and so that, that makes it a, you know, a tricky way um, to really force it there. Um, even from the consumer side, we've done some surveys with uh, members of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology who are bird watchers. So you would think like, here's a group that would be the most prime to really think about probably, you know, certifications and coffee and of interest in that. And what we see is for things like bird-friendly coffee, right? Less than less than ten percent demand it. Less than twenty percent are even familiar with that certification. So this really shows that certifications alone aren't going to do the job. Um. So so the conservation community has looked into various alternatives. One of the ones that we studied here with Miguel Gomez and Juan Nicolas's um, student was um direct trade. Because a lot of, um, there's a lot of thought now that, well, direct trade in some cases might be another approach that's less cumbersome than some of the certification programs, but might be provide incentives for farmers to use to both treat your workers better, but also in a safer kind of for workers um, conditions, but also a healthier environments, which produce better quality coffee. And so we um, studied, um, 300 different farms down in Colombia that were associated with direct trade or not associated with those programs. And we found that when the farmers were engaged with direct trade relationships, they did conserve more water, use more organic methods, they um, supported, had more trees on their farms, you know, had more biodiversity, and also produced more food and products for their families. So it was socially beneficial for them as well. We've also found just, you know, just from even that same um, sample where we were able to get um, coffee quality scores from the, the cooperative. So this is the professional, you know, coffee tasters are, are, you know, rating the beans, rating the taste. And we do find that the number, as the number of trees increase, we do get an increase, you know, gen, you know there's a lot of noise because farm conditions vary a lot. But we do find that even in our sample, coffee quality increased. And even looking at birds, as coffee quality increases, or the number of birds does as well. So there is some alignment with producing good quality, that specialty coffee, and you know, doing having sort of pro-environment, pro-biodiversity um, results. Another um, incentive that we're seeing that's um, kind of um, resulting in some change in the industry is just different businesses are recognizing that they're going to have to mitigate the climates 
on these coffee farms. So both thinking about climate change writ large, but also just the microclimates where their coffee is being grown as one way to ensure their own supply of coffee. Um, so as we, as we look at climate change projections, you know, right now they're forecasting that we're going to see a loss of about 30% of suitable land to grow Arabica in Central America, about 20% reduced land in South America. Um, because, and the reason is that temperatures are rising. It's getting drier and it's getting warmer. And that's especially impactful to the quality, um, the highest quality coffee. Now, in general, right, as you move upslope into cooler conditions that where berries can grow more slowly, that is associated with a better quality berry. Okay? And so um, what, we, what we're seeing now is that groups like two of our partners we work with, Espresso and Ecom, they're now actively planting millions of trees on the farms that they're sourcing coffee, providing farmers premiums for having trees on their lands um, for the coffee. And they're doing this not only to be responsible from an ecological you know, social perspective, but also from a sort of business model, right? They want to make sure that they're able to source high quality coffee for their consumers because that's how they differentiate their products from others. There are some natural incentives that are related to pests and disease as well. And so coffee, like a lot of crops, is vulnerable to, um, to different agents. Um, it, two of the, the big ones that affect coffee now in Latin America are the coffee borer beetle, La Broca, as they'll call it. And so that will ruin the coffee crop. Um, so that can have really enormous economic impacts. And the other one is a rust called La Roya um, that's also um, has been really bad in Central America. I think Guatemala a few years ago lost about 40% you know, of their coffee crop. Um, so birds play an interesting role here. You know, so we've established earlier right, that shade coffee can be a really positive thing for, for migratory birds, but migratory birds can also be good for coffee. And a lot of the migrants are insectivorous, so they eat insects during the winter, so they can eat some of the very same insects that are damaging the coffee. And there have been studies um, that have used explosures um, in the field where they'll actually exclude birds from coffee plants. So you can imagine in a farm, you put nets that keep birds out, let insects in, you put those over some coffee plants, you don't have them on others, and you can compare the yield. And from that, we're able to get estimates of, okay, how much coffee will birds save? Um, and so we were, um, in, the, in the project with um, Miguel and his students, we were able to actually come up with some models to, to try to estimate the optimum amount of shade to include on coffee farms. And so we use different um, parameters that we had from our field studies about, okay, what's the relationship between birds and numbers of shade trees, right? So we can um, parameterize that. We know from other studies using exposures, the relationship between birds and then coffee yield by pest control. And then we also know from other studies on kind of plant physiology and coffee farms, how shade and the reduction in solar radiation will affect coffee yields. And when we put those together, you know, I mean, the simple story is probably as you would anticipate if I'm including this here, right, to highlight this incentive is that, yeah, when you have more trees, you have more birds. When you have more birds, you have fewer pests in the coffee. When you have fewer pests, you have better yields. Um, and this can, in some systems, be really profound. So Daniel Karp, who's um, a professor at, um, I think, UC Davis um, right now, he, one of his studies estimated that each insectivorous bird over the course of a year will save about 40 pounds of coffee per hectare. A hectare is about two and a half acres. And so we were able to show, too, even in regions where maybe you can't grow or there are other limitations where you wouldn't want to have all of your coffee grown under shade, 
what we found is that even if you have more trees, this is um, Inga is a nitrogen fixing genus of tree. Um, so if you have more trees, 123 trees on the farm as opposed to 70 trees um, per hectare on the farm, you know, the, that increase in canopy increases the number of birds where it actually is more profitable to include more of your farm in shade than if you include fewer trees. You know, so these results, these, these benefits really amplify um, with additional trees. Another um, source of potential benefits or, or incentives to have shade coffee also might come within the context of these global restoration efforts. And so you might have heard over the summer there were some really big studies that were showing the restoration potential um, for forest around the world and how important this is if we're going to really try to at least slow climate, some of the climate change, or ideally actually, you know, improve the conditions we're likely to face. And, and these restoration initiatives have been, you know, something that's been going on for a while now. Um, one of the big ones that's um, in Latin America is um, WRI, or the World Resources um, Initiative, had launched as part of a global effort called the Bond Challenge this 20 by 20 initiative. So trying to restore 20 million hectares of forest by the year 2020. And so each country makes its own commitments to this bond challenge and has to find ways to actually you know, get more forests out there on the landscape. A project that we have um, through the Atkinson Center looking in Nicaragua was actually trying to see, okay, well, how can Nicaragua meet their commitments? What are some of the agroforestry approaches that are going to resonate most strongly with some of their, um, with the rural residents in places that need some attention? And what we found um, by surveying 360 households was that shade coffee is actually the most popular um, I guess, intervention to try to get more trees on the landscape. Shade coffee, if you were to pay farmers to not just direct payments, but actually pay or fund converting their farm to a shade coffee plantation. So whether they were in sun or they were in pasture or, you know, growing other crops, if you were to help with those startup costs, that was the most preferred approach to restoration as opposed to shade to cow, chocolate, just paying for forest conservation or reforestation, live fences, which are borders of trees um, or fruit trees. It was kind of interesting too there that there was, um, you know, just paying them to do nothing on the land was actually less popular than paying them to grow coffee. And part of that might reflect the fact that, you know, they may anticipate the payments are going to stop and then I'm going to have all this forest, and what the heck do I do with it now? And I mean, that would require a lot of work to clear it again. So instead, this is it helps them to actually start up a new sort of income stream or livelihood. Um, and so that social element really shows, you know, I just want to as underscore, even though I'm an ecologist, I focus on that, these the collaborations we have with social scientists are enormously not only interesting, but essential. Right, because shifting behavior means understanding people and also meeting their needs. And so I just, um, one other interesting piece from that study in Nicaragua is, um, well, first I guess I'll explain this and make the point. So what you're, show, what you're seeing here is all of the different households we've interviewed. This shows the income, self-reported income, just a scale of what people are making um, based on their income, what they think they would need to kind of live a decent life, you know, for lack of a better word. You know, and so one of the interesting things that we see is that people, you know, there's a wide range, right? Like people think there's a wide range in what people think they need to live a decent life, of what they're making, you know, of where they feel they are relative for that. But what we found was that when people's perception that they perceive, so irrespective of how much income they made, when they felt that their needs were met, they were much more likely to want to participate in a forest restoration program 
than if they felt they weren't having their needs met. And that's irrespective of the absolute amount of money they're making. It's based on their own assessment, do I have what I need? Which is of course consistent you know, with all of our behavior. I mean, there's nothing, you know, but it's just, it's an important reminder that if we want to really achieve conservation or restoration in working landscapes in order to, you know, if we want to try to engage people in those kinds of pro-environment behaviors, it's absolutely essential that we do things to support their lives. You know, no different than us, right? If we're feeling like we can't, we don't have the resources we need to, you know, for our own well-being or that of our families, we're not going to be able to have the capacity to take extra steps, you know, to do more. You know, um, that's, that's no different than we see globally. So, you know, hopefully, you know, through this, you've seen with the example of coffee, how really that's one system, like a lot of agroforestry systems, that can be managed in a way to simultaneously support human health and well-being, you know, and also ecosystem services and biodiversity. And all that is, you know, you know, really that's what we need. We need to find more examples and more approaches where we can start finding innovative ways to make conservation work in these working landscapes because there's not enough land, there's not enough resources to do just one thing at a time on places on this planet. We need to achieve these multiple benefits for people and the planet alike. Um, so with that, as you can imagine, there have been lots of groups over the years and funding sources and field assistants and collaborators who have made this work possible. Um, so with that, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. So thanks again for coming. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open it up for any questions that you may have. Yeah. Um, there were two main threats to the coffee, the fuel and the rust. Can you know the effect on rust given the shape of the Yeah, great question. So the question was um, about um, the rust. So I mentioned like two of the big threats in Latin America. You have the rust, you know, about the different percentage of, of habitats that were, that were in private, public, or tribal ownership. So to clarify, that particular graph was at land in the U.S., and I was just looking ownership. For, um, for our study down in, the, in Colombia, we weren't working with indigenous communities as part of that. Um, so, so yeah, we can't assess that um, right now. There have been some interesting other um, research that's been um, with some colleagues um, up in Canada just published a, um, a couple of weeks ago just showing too. It's interesting when you look at the indigenous lands, I mean the contribution to these global biodiversity targets are enormous. So I mean, you know, cl clearly from even, I mean, of course, from social ethical reasons, it's very important, you know, to engage with, you know, indigenous communities, you know, for, for any kind of governance, you know, and, and decision making. But yeah, for, for the environmental impacts, yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot to be gained from collaborating too. Yeah. Connected to that question, are some of these farming practices um, similar to some of the indigenous um, agricultural practices? Right, so the question was about the, to what extent these practices are, are um, consistent with indigenous or similar to indigenous practices. So that probably varies a lot regionally, right? So like historically, if you think about past practices of indigenous communities, right, because coffee was grown as this understory crop, that would have been the practice. I mean, now, depending on the country and the context, I mean, you see enormous variation. Like in Guatemala, some of the indigenous communities we've worked with um, have um, near Coban, you know, they've actually lost a lot of their traditions and their, you know, heirloom crops. And there's a lot of efforts about kind of reclaiming, you know, that traditional, you know, ways of living and farming, which are better for them and the community. Other indigenous communities have really retained, you know, a lot of the, the history and practices that they're using. So we see, I think there's a lot of variation, you see, and, 
I wouldn't, I'm not in a place to generalize or know that, but a great question. Yeah, Rachel, you had a question? Yeah, so I'm curious about the finding about migratory birds using working landscapes preferentially. And I mean, on one side, that's great, working landscapes, yeah. shaker, coffee, good for birds. But a policy maker could see that same finding and say, great, let's convert our mature forests right. to coffee production sure, right. uh, to save the birds. So what, yeah. how, how would you respond to that? Right, yeah, and so the question is, um, you know, so if you find, right, that any species of conservation concern is using disturbed lands or working landscapes, is that an incentive to convert whatever's remaining? Um, in the case, so one could in theory make that argument. So it's always really important to contextualize the research we're finding. In the case of the Andes in this particular landscape, so we, if you think about like human settlement in the Andes, like the Incas and a lot of the, you know, original like large settlements too were were in the mountains and and it actually you saw population growth and expansion move down slope so the land use change and the loss of a lot of the native forests and old growth forests happened a long time ago so we're at a place now where there isn't actually much forest like native unused, you know, intensively managed forest in many of the Andean landscapes. And so where it does remain, usually it's already protected or yeah, it should be, you know, probably. So it's a very different situation. I think that in some regions, like maybe in like the lowland Amazon, where you have more remaining, um, a lot more forest to work with. Um, in this case, it might be that, yeah, a lot of these migrants, you know, because of just this past history, long history of a lot of use and disturbance, you know, they're both tolerant to that, it could be, but also remember, these are steeply sloped mountains where you had landslides that did happen. That is a natural disturbance regime. And if we think about coffee farms and the structure on steep slopes, that open canopy isn't unlike what the canopy structure you see on really, really steep slopes or if they've been opened up because of landslides. So it might actually be that they were adapted to use these um, kinds of habitats that were created by natural disturbances too. Just an interesting. Yeah, yep. Can you all, so like bouncing off of that, you also talked about like combining agro-tourism and eco-tourism. Does that ever become a detrimental? Does it ever like disturb the birds and sing the land at times? Right, okay. And yeah, good, good questions. It was about the, maybe the trade-offs or, um, some of the conflicts if we're trying to use ecotourism or like bird related, tour, bird related tourism and can that sometimes be detrimental and there are cases of that certainly and I mean there are cases here in the US where you know for like rails little secretive birds you know birders can actually harm them or disturb them in the coffee farms that's probably less likely because the birds are moving in the canopy so they're much higher um, in the forest so probably direct disturbance of them, you know, as, as organisms is less likely. More of the downsides could be from other um, services that might be have to go in to support tourists, you know. So if you had a lot of maybe hotels or lodges or roads or restaurants, that's where my, that would be my expectation in some of these places where you'd start seeing more of the conflict. But we always have to pair that against, you know, it's not really fair to look at, okay, like if you have a, ooh, a, a landscape, something big dropped yes. up there. <laughs> um, you know, if you, to compare it, not necessarily to like, well, a, de a landscape developed for ecotourism to one with no development, you have to think of, well, was that farmer gonna probably clear the land for some other crop too? You know, we have to really think, be really careful about what's the appropriate comparison um, in those kinds of studies. I'm sure, maybe last question, so then sure. people can leave and then I can take more individually. But. I'm just curious to know, do you see the same results for non-urban birds and endemic birds? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's about, do we see these same results for um, non-migratory birds, so like tropical residents or endemics? Endemics, no, for sure, for sure, like there are a lot of the endemics 
those are the species where you do need to probably have more of those protected areas. I mean, there are some endemics. An endemic um, bird is one that only occurs within a small, like a particular area, right? So there are some endemics that like disturbed landscapes, but mostly the endemics tend to be really dependent on, you know, kind of specialized habitat. So those often need more focused um, attention. For tropical residents, some of them do fine in coffee, but other ones are very sensitive and won't as well. So yeah, you, there's never, you know, basically any habitat you could look at in the world that you could point to is going to be good for some species and bad for others. It doesn't matter if you're looking at the, you know, the Wegmans parking lot or, you know, the, the most, you know, protected piece of forest, you know, in the Amazon, right? Some species will like it and some won't. But it's a really important to think about. That's where being specific and clearly articulating the goals of the conservation effort become, um, yeah, essential. But thanks a lot, everyone. I know there are classes. I'll be around. <laughs>